This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. And by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi and welcome uh, to Epicenter. My name is Brian Farman Crane. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. Um, so, you know, once again, just jumping right into some announcements. Uh, this week, uh, like I said, la mentioned last week, we're holding a meetup in Paris, uh, an Epicenter meetup where you can come meet the hosts, the guests, and some other listeners. And, you know, it should be a good time. Uh, ETCC as well, I I'll be giving a talk there this week on uh, a workshop on the Cosmos SDK. So if you're interested in uh, checking that out, come uh, check out my workshop. Oh, and uh, what we forgot to mention last time, we'll put this link in the show notes too. If you want to register for this meetup, then go to the website epicenter.rocks slash ECC. Uh, so we're going to have this link in the show notes too. So if you if you, you can sign up there, RSVP, you're going to get informed about the venue or, or by the time you go there, I think the venue will probably already be there. But so so go to that, make sure to go to that URL. Sonny, before we get into the episode, tell me the story of how you became the star of Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> yeah, so a couple, uh, about a year ago, uh, the... Uh, Rick Falkvinge, who is the founder of the Pirate Party, uh, I'm a huge fan of him. I I I remember in our five year AMA episode, I mentioned he's a guest I'd really love to have on at some point. Uh, so he wrote this really great uh, let. It was called the letter from the CEO of Bitcoin Cash, and it was just like this like joke kind of thing. Very good point, you know. It very similar to his book Swarmwise, but he was kind of crit critiquing like formal positions of power and kind of saying like talking about how Bitcoin Cash has to be this like decentralized community and we shouldn't be like going with like figureheads. And so he kind of said that like, you know, everyone should just give themselves uh, made up titles just to like make fun of the legacy title. So he gave himself CEO of Bitcoin Cash. So, you know, I, I decided, you know, I'm going to give myself the czar of Bitcoin Cash. And so uh, I went ahead and photo did Worked, did a little bit of Photoshop magic, and now if you ever go on my Twitter profile, my Twitter profile is myself as the czar of Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I wasn't actually, I didn't really get too involved with Bitcoin Cash until like just this past December. I was in, um, like, I went to this conference in Hong Kong where I was speaking about Cosmos, and I met, uh, that's where actually where I first met Amari as well as, you know, uh, Jason Cox, another one of the core developers, and some of the other uh, developers from the other Bitcoin Cash implementations that we mentioned last week, like B B Bitcoin Unlimited and whatnot. And so, you know, I after talking to Amari there, I got like, you know, I got kind of got actually like, okay, that was like the first time I really actually took the time to understand like what was going on in Bitcoin Cash, and I thought it was really exciting. Um, I got this cool mug out of it, which I'll be drinking from this entire episode, my Bitcoin Cash mug, which is nice. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly like pretty excited. In this episode, we'll definitely talk a lot more about you know some of the future developments, which is kind of what intrigued me a lot in this Bitcoin Cash narrative. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, let's go to our conversation with Amari. So we're here again this week with Amory Seche. He's the lead developer of Bitcoin ABC, which is the main implementation, the main client for Bitcoin Cash. So this is our big, kind of our big uh, exploration of all things Bitcoin Cash. If you haven't heard last week's episode, I would recommend you go back to last week's episode. We spoke a lot about Amory's early uh, work in Bitcoin. Uh, then kind of the block size debate, SegWit 2x. It's kind of a, a little bit of a history expedition in uh, both Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, and then how Bitcoin Cash came about, um, and and also the kind of the first technological things where Bitcoin Cash really differentiated. So in specifically transaction ordering and and uh, a thing called graphene, and we spoke about hard forks, a bunch of other things. So I recommend people check that out. But this week, uh, we want to kind of 
move, you know, continue our exploration of Bitcoin Cash and dive a bit deeper into into some more recent events as well as the future roadmap. Yeah, so thanks for joining us again, Amory. Hi, hi again. So we left off the last time when we had, you know, Bitcoin Cash as this new chain with, uh, you know, different vision, right? A vision that was more focused on, um, you know, improving uh, quickly, uh, uh, being okay with hard forks, being maybe okay with taking more risks and, and really trying to do the cash part, right? So having a, a direct peer-to-peer uh, blockchain rather than uh, kind of a settlement layer. And, you know, that seemed like a unified uh, kind of community back then. And, and now over time, it seemed to have grown more apart. And of course, this ended up resulting in the fork of Bitcoin ABC uh, and well, Bitcoin Cash and then Bitcoin what became known as Bitcoin SV. Can you tell us a little bit, how did the did there divisions in the Bitcoin Cash community emerge early on, and what were they? Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, Craig Wright, especially, who is uh, probably the most public figure behind BSV, was always a very polarizing figure uh, <laughs> because some people believe he's Satoshi, and and some people believe he's a scammer, right? So. Um, that was that was always uh, you know very controversial figure. So you know, know that controversy you know probably came up to <laughs> to its apotheos and uh, we can move on. When did Craig Wright started entering the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem? So we so we announced Bitcoin Cash at a conference in the Netherlands in Arnhem, um, and at the time Craig Wright was promising to do a pool a, a mining pool on BTC that would block SegWit, and obviously it never happened. But while he was making those claims, he, he made a lot of declaration about bit blocks and stuff like that, that uh, several bit blocker liked. And so um, what happened subsequently is that he had an easy time inserting himself into that community, uh, essentially by saying what people wanted to hear, and many people were not very careful about that. And so that's... Uh, that's how it happened. I guess I have to ask this question. Where do you uh, personally stand on this issue of Craig Wright being Satoshi or not? So there is no proof that Craig Wright is Satoshi. So in that sense, Craig Wright is as much Satoshi as, as anyone else. Uh, if he were to produce a proof, I would have to ask myself the question, do I you know, believe that proof or anything? But as long as there is no proof, you know, there is not much value in that question. I would say it is unlikely for many reasons. Um, one would be very similar to what Vitalik Buterin said at the time, right? If you have an easy way to prove something and, and instead you choose like very convoluted and, and not very convincing ways, it probably like most likely means that, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not right. And, and, you know, even if it turned out to be Satoshi, um, which I don't believe is very likely, uh, even if that was the case, it doesn't remove from the fact that, you know, he plagiarized many scientific paper, he produced many fake documents, it, you know, like generally is not the kind of person I would want to follow. So um, it would it would more, you know, it would change my opinion of Satoshi more and it would change my opinion of Craig if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, w one thing that stands out to me, so there's this book called The Book of Satoshi. And uh, I mean, you probably read many of these forum posts originally, but this is a person who just went through the Bitcoin talk forum and basically compiled a lot of the answers from Satoshi and then kind of published as a book. So I read that at one point and it was actually really, really interesting. I thought, I thought it was a, a super fascinating to kind of get a sort of look into the discussions they had back in, the way he was arguing. And, you know, I came away really impressed. I was like, wow, this guy is so, you know, smart, articulate, balanced. He seemed to be very open-minded. And then you see like Craig Wright show up and that guy's just, you know, 
constantly making these false statements, being super loud, obnoxious, angry, belligerent. And it's like, these obviously are not the same people. <laughs> that makes no, no sense. No, those are not the same people, yeah. I mean, I remember, uh, I, I met a lot of like Bitcoin Cash, uh, people in the Bitcoin Cash community, even people who are very anti, like, you know, disagree with what a lot of Craig says, who still buy into this narrative that Craig has, like, spun that he, you know, he maybe wasn't the only one who was part of Satoshi, but, like, you know, was part of this group of Satoshi. The, the most common narrative I've heard is this, like, uh, Dave Kleiman story, and, like, Craig was, like, working with him, and so, like, you know, maybe the original Satoshi was Dave, and Craig kind of, like, took over that mantle, kind of. Well, it's, it's possible, but there is no... You know, there is there is not that much proof that it is true or false one way or another. So all of that is just speculation. And people always have loved, you know, speculate about who Satoshi may be and all of that. But it's, it's just that, you know. Okay, so, you know, uh, Craig and Enchain kind of, you know, got, by the way, for those who aren't aware, Enchain is the name of uh, Craig's company. Uh, they kind of got involved with the Bitcoin Cash project a little bit early on, like you said, you know. Um, when did, was there like a sense of growing division, like from that early on, or like, I remember, I remember there was this like big conference called the Satoshi's vision conference about a year and a half ago or so. And it seemed that everything had like a very unified front back at that point. And, uh, I don't know. Have you, have you seen his entry at that conference? I think that was extremely cringy. I, I actually don't know anything about this. Uh, so could you... Okay, uh, so so he went up on stage with like some kind of rock music, you know, clapping ends of people along the way or whatever. That was that was extremely cringy. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think Craig can feel shame, but, you know, I think a lot of people felt shame for him that day. I see. And so you think like... So do you think that there was like an early divisions showing up just purely around like the cult of personality that Craig has built up? And like, so, you know, maybe there wasn't any, maybe early on there wasn't much technical division, but there was a feeling of like, oh, what's this guy doing? Like he's building this cult of personality and it might be a threat to like the success of the project or what? what oh, yeah, yeah. Was? Even even before it started, like even before the fork, that was... That was something that was there. A lot of people were very worried of him. Uh, the problem is, or you know, it's a problem, or it's not a problem. It's a problem in that case. I think it's generally, you know, it's generally a good thing, but it's a problem in that case. Uh, if you have a decentralized community uh, that is, you know, like very formed itself from the ground up, then uh, there is nobody that can say, okay, this this guy is not part of the community and needs to go, right? Right, and as long as you have a significant portion of the community that is uh, willing to have him around, then you know he's gonna be around. I see. And so, why do you think there was like you know at least for like you know I guess what we talked about last week was uh, you know the year one of Bitcoin Cash. And so, why do you think during that year one of Bitcoin Cash, like there weren't many people calling him out in that like at least publicly? I don't know. They were though, like almost almost all the technical people called him out at some point, especially when he did his, um, you know, his stuff about selfish mining. A lot of people called him out. Um, the problem is that those ID are fairly complex. Like you know, the the, the idea of selfish mining is, um, you know, fairly fairly difficult to grasp to someone that doesn't have a, a technical background, and and it's fairly counterintuitive, right? So if you if you just have a cursory knowledge of all that work, it seems that it seems that something like selfish mining would not be. But uh, it turns out that when you run the math, it actually works out. And and so when that happened, a lot of people called him out. Um, this is when he came up with the negative gamma thing, uh, <laughs> where for people who don't know, gamma is like a, a proportion of nodes that takes some action based uh, compared to the, the total number of nodes. So it's obviously a number that is between zero and one. Uh, it cannot even be zero or one, actually. It's like between zero and one excluded. And so, so obviously gamma cannot be negative. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> That's the one where like Vitalik called him out uh, on like stage. Well, Vitalik called him out. I mean, Kutsir called him out. I called him out. Uh, Peter Ryzen for Bitcoin Unlimited called him out. Like almost everybody that have a solid technical background was about to call him out on that one. Uh, 
Actually, it's it's very funny because then it was like, okay, negative gamma is possible because the notion of negative probability is the same. And he he, he quoted a paper, uh, supposedly that would you know support his claim. And it turns out that a friend of mine know the guy that wrote the paper. So so that friend of mine, um, uh, you know, got in touch with the person writing the paper. And and that person essentially came out and and said that the interpretation of the paper that Craig was making is obviously completely uh, completely wrong. Um, and this is, I, I don't know, famous, it is very famous in the in the BCH space. There is this quote, uh, risk finance, um, where Craig essentially, like, his whole argument was crumbling down and he answered by risk finance in, like, in, like, in the tweet of two words that, you know, really don't mean anything. But that was quite yeah. funny. So now... No people use risk finance as like a, a go to catch phrase when you want to <laughs> when you want to uh, demonstrate like when you want to say that something is completely nonsensical and so people are gonna use that now. I think with Bitcoin SV, I haven't. I mean, it was it was a mystery to me why anybody uh, anybody would buy this. Why this was so. I, I think Bitcoin SV doesn't seem. Like a particularly serious project, and and Craig Wright, I think we all uh, share our skepticism about him. So I don't think we should spend too much time on. But just briefly, so I mean, were there really any? Can you talk about the fork or like what were there? Were there some technical differences in in you know different opinions about where Bitcoin should technically go? And and can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So one of the, essentially there were two very big arguments coming from the SV side before the fork. One was about this wormhole project. So wormhole is a, a token solution that works on BCH. And um, to ensure scarcity uh, so that you cannot use all the resources available on the system, uh, they, they, use, uh, they use a mechanism where you burn some coin. Right, and so that was uh, very to the dislike of the BSV camp, which uh, I find rather funny because if people want to burn their coin, as far as I'm concerned, like I wouldn't burn my coin, but if people want to burn their coin, this is theirs, right? This is like exactly the the financial freedom that we want to 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 deliver to people, right? If people want to huddle, they can huddle. If people want to spend their coin, they can spend their coin. If they want to burn them, they, you know, it's up to it's up to every single individual to decide what they want to do with that coin. So that, that part was a bit um, a bit of a problem. And the second part that they argued a lot about was canonical transaction ordering. But what happened is that early on, you can even find on the Enchain website, well, probably they removed it by now, but it was at the time for like the whole year that it was in their roadmap because it was something that was discussed a long time ago. And then Craig was again, and then we had uh, a meeting in Paris with a few other people where he ended the agreeing again, and then it was against uh, against it again. So it was like constant flip flopping. So I, I don't think I don't think this is the actual reason. I think those people wanted a wanted a fight essentially, <laughs> and they picked up whatever reason was uh, you know available at the time. But I cannot read mine, right? So that's just. That just what seems the, to be the, the case to me. So is there anything uh, left to this story? Like, do you think Bitcoin SV is just going to disappear or, or is, is there still kind of issues remaining from the split? Well, I don't think that roadmap makes a lot of sense, but, you know, if they want to do it, you know, good for them. Uh, this, is, this is the freedom that Fork brings to the table, right? This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. We couldn't be more excited about the upcoming mainnet launch and to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core an advanced implementation of the BFT proof-of-stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, 
and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So what exactly is their roadmap here? Like, you know, they have this like tagline of Satoshi's vision. And what is so I know what theirs, the- right? It comes from the conference Satoshi's vision that were organized by other people. Everything they have, like it comes from somewhere else. The whole uh-huh. stuff is a giant copy paste. So, um, so what, what, from my understanding, there was this like idea that they're bringing in, in Bitcoin SV where they're trying to like push it back to essentially like the, oh, Bitcoin 0.1 was the ultimate perfect version of Bitcoin. And that's why they're like re-enabling so, opcodes. I don't know. I, I think they have a, a strategy that is more interesting than that, not from a technical standpoint, but from more of a sociological standpoint, because uh, the motto they are going for is that it's what Bitcoin was intended to be. And what is great is that Satoshi is not around anymore. So Satoshi is not going to say, you know, oh, this is not what I intended, right? So so when you do that, you don't even have to do exactly what was in 0.1 or whatever. You can claim that, oh, this is what Satoshi intended. And, <laughs> and uh, so there is a very religious aspect to it, you know, like, like people that are going to preach are going to say, okay, this is what Jesus met when, you know, whatever whatever story from the Bible happened, right? And you have like different different priests that have different interpretation of, of what that is. But they are all like, okay, this is this is what Jesus meant, right? And, okay. and you have a very similar phenomena where uh, the leader of BSV, they pose themselves in kind of a high priest uh, who can interpret the Holy Scripture of Satoshi and, and, and told the people what Satoshi intended there, which I, I find a very... It's it's a very fascinating phenomena from a sociological standpoint, but I don't think it's very uh, you know solid base to build a cryptocurrency on. I see, and so I remember also like part of what led up to the split was that Enchain like submitted a proposal about adding like some specific opcodes, and those were chosen not to be included in this hard fork, but rather in the next one. Can you tell us a little bit about like what what, what exactly was that like you know? timeline there of like that of the technical roadmap which caused this like final the last straw to break essentially okay yeah sure so um enchain wanted a series of opcode to be re-enabled um that that used to you know that used to exist in the very initial version of bitcoin but that were disabled because the implementation was buggy and and so they were disabled at the time and enchain wanted to re-enable those opcodes and so in the in the fork in May before before the one where there was a split the the one before that um, we renewed some of the upcodes and and Chain said they would do the work and everything but at the end uh, a, a ton of the work uh, ended up being done by uh, Shabaston Selor and Jason Cox and myself to to make it happen because there is a lot of um, there is a lot of work to do between you know, something that, that works and something that is production quality. And, and they were not quite willing to, you know, they delivered something that, that works, but, you know, they were not willing to push it to the kind of quality requirement that, that we wanted. And, and so the first time we did it, uh, uh, but the second time we don't want it to do it. <laughs> and so it did not happen. That's, that's pretty much what happened there. Okay, so we had these like two conflicting uh, technical visions, and you know, largely fueled a lot by um, personal notes. Yeah, so. personal issues. So, could you walk us through a little bit about the timeline of like what exactly happened during the hard fork? Because like you know, a lot of people, I think a lot of people may have like you know heard of this, and like you know, they're like, oh, there's something going on, some hash war or something. Uh, I know what like uh, Roger Ver keeps flip flopping back and forth. Um, so could you explain to us like, okay, so, you know, and you know, there was some drama around replay protection. So could you just like take us through a walkthrough for like people who aren't really that familiar with what exactly happened? Like what was the timeline of the, like the month or two leading up to this fork and as, as the fork was happening? Okay. So, um, 
three months before the fork, it's when we have a freeze date for you know what's going to be in the fork, so the, the ecosystem can get ready and we can have a, you know a lot of time to test. And if there is some problem, we have time to readjust everything. So three months before the fork, we end up with the freeze date, and it turned out that those opcodes you know don't make the cut. Uh, and after that, there was a meeting in in Bangkok. Um, where essentially that was a missing to you know try to find a common ground or find try to find if there was a common ground that existed. Uh, you have the audio the audio recording of that meeting are available online if you want to to look for them. But um, essentially what happened is that the first day in the morning, uh, Craig Wright stormed out of the room, uh, screaming. Uh, <laughs> screaming insults and stuff. And so uh, it ended up not being a very productive meeting because then there were two people uh, remaining, or three maybe, three people remaining representing and shame and stuff, but they were not the one having too much, you know, decision-making power. So, um, so it ended up being not very productive, right? And nothing happened there. So, so moving forward, they decided of that to start an alternative client. So they, they forked Bitcoin ABC before we, you know, at the stage before we implement the fork. And, um, and they call it Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision because uh, there was the Satoshi's Vision conference and it was a name that, you know, it was a name that, that was popular. So they reused that. Uh, and then they decided to to run that client and then they were ensuring everybody that there would be no fork uh there would be like one coins and but everybody that knew of all oh, this technology is working right was like okay if you are running a client that have different consensus rules then they're going to be too chain right this is <laughs> this is all that work right but all those people were like oh no no there are not going to be any fork Blah blah blah. So you know, and did it happen? And there is two clients with two different rules. So no, there is two chains. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's simple as this. Okay. So then you know we had this fork happen. Um, there was this hash war that happened once the fork started, right? And so, could you tell us what the what exactly the goal was here? Like, who are the major mining pools that were supporting? Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin ABC, and who were the mi major mining pools supporting Bitcoin SV? And why did people make such a yeah, big deal so the, out of the this hash whole, war? The whole hash war narrative was always very bizarre to me because I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Um, because uh, once you have two chains, right, they are never going to merge into each other or anything, right? It, like it doesn't really matter how much hash there is on which one, or you have two coins, and, and it's it's not going to change anything. So. Um, what happened is that you had uh, mostly CoinGeek and BMG, which is the, the mining branch of, um, of Enchain. So those people were mining BSV uh, at a fairly significant loss. And then they made threat of 51% uh, attack and stuff like that. So there were uh, some other miners that were friendly to BCH decided to put extra hash on, on BCH to you know, disincentivize any kind of any kind of fifty one percent attack, and and that was you know that was the end of it. Essentially. There's a little bit of I remember there was also a little bit of like controversy around like I think Bitcoin.com I think it was who like you know started to move a lot of its hash power over to Bitcoin Cash from Bitcoin, but like you know without really informing their constituent miners that like oh your hash power is being used for a purpose other than what you maybe expect it's being used for. And so do you think like, you know, I guess it's kind of like a separate question, but do you think this is like, you know, uh, an okay thing to do for on, on the behalf of a mining pool operator? Or do you think like we should put more accountability on these mining pool operators to prevent them from doing these kind of things? Okay, so um, I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have like all the internal information of what's going on at Bitcoin.com. Uh, so if you want, the specific detail on that one, you you would have to have an episode maybe with Roger or, or someone else from Bitcoin.com. But generally, right, it, it really depends on the contract that the mining pool and the miner have between each other. A lot of um, a lot of the mining pools nowadays have the kind of contract where the mining pools say we're going to mine BDC and BCH and try to 
equilibrate between the two and and then you know payback depending on what the reward is uh, may not the payback may not even be in the coin that that the people have chosen so if this is the kind of contract that people are under i don't think this is that much of a of a deal but if the contract is very clear that i am mining btc or i'm mining bch then that's that's a bit of a different uh, that's a bit of a different issue it's it's all about you know what what was the agreement between the two on the miner, right? Yeah. So let's just a, a final thing on this, and then I would say let's let's move uh, on from this topic. So there's a lawsuit going on now, Craig Wright is suing you and some other people. Can you tell us what's this lawsuit about? Yeah. So I'm not a lawyer, so it's a, a bit difficult. But there is a there is a lawsuit uh, where some some company in Florida that is uh, apparent to uh, the BSV community is suing, uh, so myself, as you mentioned, but uh, Jianhu, uh, Roger, uh, Jess Powell from Kraken, uh, a few other BCH developers. And um, I think that's it from memory. Yeah. So uh, they essentially sue those people because supposedly there is a, a great collusion that happened to um, uh, to not respect what was written, like the, it's it's very bizarre. It seems it seems to me, but I'm not a lawyer, right? So, uh, but it seems to me that they are interpreting the white paper as some legally binding document or something like that, and and they are extracting some part of it, and then they are you know um, saying that there is some grand conspiration around it to subvert illegally the white paper uh, between you know myself and and those other people. Um, which is, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we'll see how that goes, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense. You have to take it seriously, though. It's always legal stuff, but from from the aspect that, that is of interest to us, like the, you know, cryptocurrency and stuff like that, I don't think what a, I don't know what a judge is going to think of it, and I'm not qualified. Wasn't there also to, this issue to say around... anything, but from, from a crypto or a technical perspective, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. And there's part of the law should I remember was also around something around the ticker where like, you know, there was some grand conspiracy of like stealing the Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what they're saying. And they are interpreting so part of the white paper, uh, saying that, you know, according to the white paper, something else should have happened according to their interpretation of the white paper. And, and. It seems to me that they're considering it a, a legally binding document. I would say I would say the interpretation of the white paper is wrong, but it doesn't even matter because it's probably not a legally binding document. But you know, like I'm really not. I'm really not the best person to ask that. You should ask a lawyer or, or you know a judge or someone like that. I'm not even an American citizen. I'm, I'm not a super friendly obviously. But. All right, so you know, let's go ahead and move on, uh, you know, past the fork and like you know what's uh, into the future of Bitcoin Cash. Um, so you know, when, when when I met you for the first time last December, uh, one of the proposals you were talking to me about, which I thought was actually very fascinating and exciting, was this idea of uh, avalanche pre-consensus and so really helping, uh, and especially like you know, uh, you you talked a lot about why it will help uh, improve. Uh, zero con the security of zero con transactions. So, could you go ahead and tell us one why is why do you care so much about the security of zero con transactions, and then two uh, what is Avalanche and how will that help? So to begin with, if if we go back to the goal of the project, the goal of the project is to create a form of digital cash that has you know as as best as possible property um, like monetary property, right and and so very early on, what was identified as a point we need to work on our uh, uh, confirmation time um, and, and fungibility and scaling, right? Uh, so we talked a bit about scaling before, um, but, but zero, conf is, um, zero conf is something else because right now in Bitcoin or any Bitcoin derivative, the block time is 10 minutes. And so it takes on average 10 minutes when you, between the time you make a transaction and the time this transaction confirm, right? And during that 10 minute window, there is a lot of opportunity to do a double spend. So we don't think that's ideal, 
Um, and, and one of the, the solution people are working on to make things better on that front is a technology called Avalanche. So Avalanche is a technology where essentially when there is a double spend going on, uh, nodes are going to run a protocol between themselves to decide which one is the, which one is the correct one and which one is not. And then the result of that algorithm can be used by miner to mine one or the other. And, and so that can give you a very fast, very fast information about which one, um, you know, which transactions are going to be valid and, and are going to eventually be mined and which one are not. We want to dig more in, in some detail. It was like very high level, but that's the general idea. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS, and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. There was the paper that came out from, uh, you know, this, you know, secret team called Team Rocket, but, you know, uh, Emin Gunsire kind of sort of become a little bit of the face of it. And so, you know, we definitely love to have him on. We just haven't, you know, gotten time to organize that around and you know, talking a bit about Avalanche. But, you know, so this Avalanche that you're talking about, is it at all related to that paper or is it, are these just two different things or just like, you know, loosely inspired? What's the relationship between this Avalanche pre-consensus we're talking about here versus the Avalanche consensus protocol that yeah, was proposed so in that paper? This is what is explained in the paper, though we use it in a different way from what I mean, our team wants to do. So what I mean, Gunsir wants to do is uh, something called Avacoin. And this is a cryptocurrency uh, that is going to be based on Avalanche only, uh, Avalanche being the only consensus mechanism that this is going to use. And uh, this is not what we want to do with BCH. So what we want to do with BCH is a bit different. Um, what we want to do with BCH is, is uh, keep the blockchain like it is uh not not change anything on that front as per avalanche because there is a huge amount of software that that rely on that and it's actually uh very it's a very strong consensus mechanism it's very hard to rewrite history and so on right so it has it has very very good properties but it has one property that is not very good it's that it's slow to converge and there is no way to make it fast enough for what we want you want a transaction to be essentially final within a few seconds, right? And the more you reduce the block time, the faster you need to propagate the blocks and validate them at, at a given scale, right? Because you always have this constraint that the time you need to propagate and validate the block need to be small compared to the block time. So you already have a tension here between how fast you can validate um, uh, validate that a transaction is not going to have a double spend and how much scaling you want. And because we want both scaling and, uh, and fast confirmation on BCH, we have, a, we have a bit of a problem here. So the plan is to keep the blockchain as it is with 10 minute block time. But in between the block, the node can run Avalanche uh, to, to decide essentially what's going to go in the next block. And if you do it that way, uh, you still have all the, the good property of the blockchain, but you can improve that um, you can improve that with avalanche. But in order to do this avalanche pre-consensus, you 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 need some notion of um, 
choosing who the nodes are, right? Yes. And so you usually you either do this through some sort of proof of work mechanism or through proof of stake. And so what's the uh, is the idea here to uh, use proof of stake essentially to choose the nodes in this avalanche consensus? So or? The, the proposal right now is still a bit up in the air. Um, it seems that, you know, like some people want to do it based on proof of work. So you can have like, you know, the set of previous miners uh, that that choose, um, you know, that run the avalanche, that run the avalanche consensus mechanism. You can also have people that have a certain amount of coins that do it. We haven't really settled on, on one or the other yet. And the reason is there is a lot of incentive to be considered, right? It's uh, it's a very difficult problem, and you don't want to screw up the incentive of the system. So, we haven't, you know, we haven't finalized a decision on that one. I would, I would love if we can just uh, explain that uh, avalanche a little, like take a step back and try to explain avalanche for somebody who who doesn't understand it. Uh, I mean, I think the the zero confirmation challenge. I think that's that's kind of clear, right? So. Issue is basically I, I I do let's say I send some coin Bitcoin Cash to Sunny, and the problem is I can just send another transaction sending it to myself, and now before it's in the next block, Sunny can't really rely on that payment too much, and I could go to a miner and say hey listen I send one Bitcoin to Sunny he gives me uh, I don't know some product for it, and then I go to the miner and say hey listen I this is a transaction paying one Bitcoin to me. I give you 10% of it, but like put that in not Sunny's and I can defraud Sunny, yeah. right? So that's the kind of uh, traditional fear there. Of course, of course, historically, uh, I mean, that's some risk, but it hasn't actually happened often. And uh, traditionally, you had Bitcoin payment processors like BitPay. They would just accept your confirmation payments for at least for a lot of things. Maybe it depends on the amount and stuff. Uh, but it always was considered a bit insecure. Many Bitcoin developers thought this was uh, reckless, shouldn't be done. Uh, but quite obviously, right? Uh, so I think the, the case for, or oh, if you can make zero confirmation secure, like that's fantastic. But can you, can you explain again, like how does Avalanche accomplish this? First, I need to explain maybe why it's a difficult problem. And uh, in, in traditional payment system, it's not a very difficult problem, right? So if you send two transactions to PayPal and one that send money to Sony and one that send money somewhere else, uh, then PayPal is going to decide, you know, is there one or the other is valid and reject the other and this is the end of it. And they can do that very quickly. But because Bitcoin is a decentralized system, then... Uh, there is not one authority that can decide here is here is the one and here is the one that like here is the one that is right and the one that is wrong, right? And because it's distributed, then you know maybe some people are gonna see the transaction that send the money to Sunny first, and maybe some people are gonna see the transaction where you send the money maybe to yourself first, right? And and those they are not gonna agree on which transaction is the real one. So what they are gonna do is that each, uh, each node is going to uh, randomly choose a set of peers and query them. And, and they're going to ask them, like, do you think the transaction to Sunny and, or the transaction to yourself is, is the correct one? And the node itself has its own opinion depending on which one it has seen first, right? And so what's going to happen is that depending on the result of that polling, the node is going to say, okay, is the result of that polling agrees with what I think is true? If the answer is no, then the node is going to change his mind and, and start again from scratch, but with you know, the other position. And if the polling agree with what the node is thinking, then the node is going to increase its confidence that this is uh, the correct result. And you run several rounds of that. And, and once, a, once a node uh, uh, reaches a certain level of confidence, once it's high enough, then they're not consider, okay, this is like this is the final um, this is the final decision on that matter. And so what happened is that you can prove that all the honest nodes on such network are gonna converge toward the same result. And what you see in practice is that it happened very quickly, typically in about two seconds. Okay, okay. So 
Uh, I'm getting this transaction from, uh, or like, let's say you're the miner, you're getting the transaction from me, and then you like you query the other nodes, and and now you're getting another transaction spending the same output after the, after that. Now you have both transactions. You query the other nodes, and you you basically. So so it, would it be like whichever transaction you get first, that's kind of the one. You say that's the valid one, unless others convince you that the other one was propagated. Yes, more yes, quickly. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, and then I guess the the risk scenario here would be, of course, some miner, the 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 next miner who mines a block. I mean, he could just put the other one in there anyway, because, and then uh, then you this gets reverted, nonetheless, or. Well, in that case, um, what what miner are gonna do is that this, this block is not gonna match what the preconsensus agreed upon, and well, the, the proposal is a bit more subtle than that. The proposal is that you're gonna orphan the block that has something that contradicts the decision that has been made. If that makes sense, yeah, it's it's a bit different because it's you don't have to mine exactly what the preconsensus has decided. Maybe you want to mine an empty block. Maybe you want to mine some transaction that you know nobody agreed upon yet. But if there is something that people have agreed upon, so if people have agreed that the transaction to Sony is the right one, and the miner decide to put the transaction when you send the coin to yourself, then the network is going to consider that this miner is not an honest miner. And, and the other miner are not going to mine on top of this block. Okay, okay. So basically the different transactions get sent around uh, and there starts to be some agreement that, okay, you know, this is a, this is sort of a transaction we have some loose agreement on. And once that becomes pretty strong, uh, if somebody else mines a block and they include a transaction that, you know, contradicts that, then, you know, start orphaning it. And I guess that becomes sort of not like a clear binary thing, but more uh, like so rough. So the the general idea is that yeah you you uh, you do what we call you park the block so the block is not invalid per se it respects all the consensus rules but you are not just gonna uh, activate it yet and you can run a round of avalanche on the block itself to know if other people are accepting the block or not but what's gonna happen is that most people are gonna reject that block and so it's gonna be declared uh, declared all fun. So would you like start giving it like some sort of like negative bias and like the diff like if in its difficulty calculation maybe that's how you would do it or? Uh, so what you do is that every time you you do a round of avalanche and that the result is conformant with what you expect you increase your confidence, right? And when the confidence goes uh, above a certain threshold, then you consider that this decision is finalized. I see. So. But this is like a, you know, essentially a very heavy change to the consensus algorithm. It's no longer like a minor change anymore. You're, you're, you're essentially changing the fork choice rules themselves on. Uh, yes. What is interesting, though, is that it's actually what is described in the white paper uh, that like yeah, the NACTA, what people refer as Nakamoto consensus in the white paper. Uh, um, it is said that um, if a miner consider a block to be valid, they are going to vote for you know, that block to be valid by trying to mine on top of it. And if they consider a block to not be valid, they are going to mine, uh, you know, vote against it by refusing to mine on top of it. Uh, but so far in Bitcoin, there was no mechanism for, um, for any miner to be able to agree on anything there, right? They cannot communicate really uh, their action on that front, and they cannot coordinate in any way. So what ended up happening is that the miner so far have been voting yes, always, right? Every time you receive a block, if it's valid that has spared the consensus rule, everybody votes yes, all the time. And the idea is to change this so that, you know, a miner can vote yes or no, but if you don't have some kind of synchronization mechanism, then voting no is very disincentivized. But by offering a way for miner who want to vote no to coordinate, we can make that happen. Do you have like some sort of like paper or something in the process of like, you know, 
analyzing this because like, like I said this just sounds like a very large change and it'll be very interesting to read like something like proving the safety and liveness of this system so the liveness is uh, not ensured right there right. is that's actually uh, kind of what I'm more worried about is the yeah. liveness where like you know you have a bunch of miners mining on one thing but everyone else is rejecting it and it just like yeah well, but um, this this is where the economic incentive of the system, uh, um, you know, getting in place. If you if you mine something that nobody accepts, you are essentially burning electricity away with no revenue. So you cannot be, do that for so long. I see. This is this is where the net climate consensus um, uh, is actually quite brilliant because you have a very strong economic incentive to form consensus with everybody else. So, you know, the the goal of this was to solve the uh, zero-con problem. Isn't the zero-con problem also solved by a other one of Emin's proposals, uh, Bitcoin NG? Like, I feel like Bitcoin NG actually... Yes. Okay, so two, two things on that front. Um, the fact that it solves zero-con is actually not the primary... Um, well, it's actually not what it does. It's it's the consequences of what it does, but what it does is uh, maybe a bit deeper. What it does is allow nodes to synchronize their state uh, on an ongoing basis instead of doing once every 10 minutes. And if you do that, you have better zero conf, uh, you know, insurance about zero conf, but it's also easier to scale the system because now, the reconciliation that you have to do when you receive a new block is uh, smaller, right? You can you can prepare most of the block ahead of time because you know what it's going to look like. Uh, you also get stronger property uh, when it comes to fifty one percent attack. And but ng ng have uh, have similar ideas. So ng the way it works is that the miner that find the block essentially becomes a, a leader for the next ten minutes. And when there is a double spend or something like that, the leader is going to be essentially, the leader is going to be Visa or MasterCard or PayPal or, or whatever for 10 minutes, right? And it's going to say, okay, there is a double spend here. Here is what is the correct one. Here is what is the wrong one. So uh, this is a system that works, though it has different trade-off uh, when it comes to Avalanche. And the first one is because you elect a leader, uh, if the leader uh, screw up, or if the leader is dishonest, or if the leader screw up, or if the leader fails for some reason, then the whole system need to wait for 10 minutes for a new block to be found and a new leader to be elected. Right. So it's not as reliable. And then you have an obvious attack is that if you know who the leader is, you can dedos the leader continuously, right? And and after the system never deliver. Another another concern about it is that the economic incentives are not very strong for the leader to behave properly because the economic incentives are based on fees and fees are low on BCH. So as a result, the incentive for the miner to behave properly are low. And so it was, it was not an ideal solution, but it's a solution we looked into. But we think that Avalanche is a, a superior proposal. So, are there any uh, major downsides to this? Like, do are maybe new attacks, uh, new vectors of maybe centralization uh, get opened up by adding Avalanche? Yes, and no. So, Avalanche is so just like the blockchain. Actually, the blockchain is a consensus mechanism, and Avalanche is another consensus mechanism that have a bit of a different trade-off. Um, one of them is that. Even though most of the time it converts toward the solution very quickly, it's not guaranteed. Uh, it's not guaranteed by the protocol. So if you have a large amount of hostile actor in there, they can prevent uh, Avalanche for, from finalizing any decision, especially by flip-flopping themselves, right? So if a large proportion of the node flip-flop constantly, it's going to be very difficult for the network as a whole to come to a conclusion. Whereas this kind of flow doesn't exist on the blockchain, right? If a miner puts something in the block, this is in the block, right? There is no situation where something is going to uh, be, uh, you know, unknown for forever. And so having a combination of the two essentially ensure that worst case scenario in 10 minutes, you will know, but most of the time you will know in two seconds. 
you know, another trade-off that you make is that uh, when you have a blockchain, you have a very uh, easily verifiable record of history. So if I bootstrap a new node, I can connect to the blockchain, see what is the longest chain and synchronize to that, right? If I have a, a non-launch kind of system, well, I wasn't there when Avalanche made the decision to begin with, so I don't quite know what was the decision at the time, so I need to, um, you know, repull all the nodes, but it, that means that you need to have like a whole history of transaction indexed uh, so that that new node can run that on another node, or so node can change their mind later, right? Like you can connect to a new network and there is a bunch of malicious nodes that have to take the wrong branch or whatever. There is there is a ton of problem that exists with Avalanche on that front that don't exist with the blockchain. And so um, you got you to gotta see Avalanche as a mechanism that is uh, much faster most of the time, but that is not very good if you are not there to participate at the moment. Right? If you are there and you see everything going on, then it's very good. But if you, you know, catch up later on, or if you are a mobile device, you know, that connect to the network once in a while to see what your coins are, like a mobile wallet, it's not very good either. So uh, I think the combination of the two makes most sense. It's like Avalanche is not this magical stuff that solves every single problem. You guys have this like really uh, nice graphic uh, roadmap on your uh, on the BitcoinCash.com website, and it's just very like nice roadmap, and it kind of has these uh, three um, pillars to it. And so you know we've talked, which I I remember being uh, scalability, usability, and extensibility. And so you know we've we've talked we talked quite a bit about the scalability side of things as now, and as well as like you know the usability with the. Uh, with, you know, improving zero conf and, you know, there's many other things on that roadmap. We obviously don't have time to get to all of them today, but I'd like to touch a little bit now on that uh, third pillar, which is the um, extensibility. And so what is the goal for what, what does this mean in like uh, Bitcoin Cash? What does this extensibility mean? And, you know, could you tell us a little bit about this new op code that I've been hearing buzz or buzz about uh, op check data sig and like how that uh, contributes to extensibility. Yeah, so extensibility, the, the general idea of extensibility is provide way for people to do more, like to, you know, to, to implement new functionality or whatever. Um, and, and yeah, one of the big steps that have been made recently is object data sync. So object data sync is an opcode in, in script that is going to check a signature on arbitrary data. So right now, all the all the operation that check a signature, check a signature based on the transaction itself. So that's good for raw payments. You can, you know, sign the transaction and someone can verify that, you know, you are the, the actual creator of the transaction. But if you can sign any piece of data, you can implement a bunch of new features. So one very interesting one is uh, what is called zero conf forfeit. So this is a, a technology where you can make a script, uh, and, and the script is such as, if I can produce several signatures for the same public key, that means that someone tried to spend the same coin twice, right? And so you can attach a mountain to that, and it is, you can attach an amount to, to that, and it's essentially an insurance uh, against fraud, right? Like, I can, I can essentially... Uh, um, put some coin in some smart contract with you. And this is, okay, this is a guarantee that I'm not going to double spend you. And if I ever try to double spend you, then you can claim the, you can claim those coins, right? So that's, that's one idea that people had with it. Another idea is oracles. So the blockchain, you can write contracts in the blockchain based on any information that exists in the blockchain, but you always run into some problem when you want to base a contract based on something that is not in the blockchain, right? So Maybe we want a bet of uh, about who is going to be the next uh, president of the United States, like in, in uh, I think two years, 2020, I think the next election is uh, in the US. Anyway, we, we can bet on that, for instance. But it turns out that the president is not in the blockchain, right? So we don't quite know um, how to write a smart contract between the two of us to make that happen. And... What you can do is actually you can uh, ask an oracle. So an oracle is someone that we both trust 
or maybe we can ask a set of oracle instead of one oracle if we want to be more um, you know have less trust into one one specific entity and this oracle is uh, gonna uh, authenticate some result uh, some information from the real world uh, and, and sign that with this public key and then we can use that within our contract and so we can make all kind of like the possibility are truly endless with Oracle. We can make any kind of contract, as long as we have some Oracle that is willing to certify some information from the work that we both trust, we can do anything. We can say, okay, if the price of Bitcoin next week is, you know, more than that, then, then do X, right? And then we can have an Oracle that say, sign the price of, of Bitcoin, you know, every hour or every day or whatever. And, and we can use that to build our contract. Um, really like yeah the, the possibility of are very 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 wide and people are doing all kind of stuff with that there's a, a new opcode that's being added into uh bitcoin called uh check signature from uh, stack and so that will that's very similar and you know they're working on a lot of stuff around things like you know scriptless uh scripts and like a lot of these things that will basically add like complete smart contracting functionality to uh, Bitcoin. Is this something that you guys are also looking at for Bitcoin Cash, or kind of is there anything? Or I'm sure, like you know, is there anything that you guys are actively developing, or are you kind of just letting uh, you know the Bitcoin Core team like work, develop this, and maybe if it works, like port it over to Bitcoin Cash? Uh, so so far, we have been developing those stuff. It, it's quite funny that you mentioned the check signature from Stack, or I'm, I'm not sure what the opcode is name, but something like that, uh, because we had several iteration on check data sig and the final iteration ended up being exceedingly similar to check signature from stack. But um, I, I assume that they must have went through a similar process and you know I've, I've discovered a similar issue because we kind of realized that at the end of the process that we have uh, we have done something that is you know extremely similar to what they were doing. But for for those other opcodes and and other things, well you know we'll we'll see I guess it depends on um, you know, case by case basis. Uh, one thing that is missing on BCH that I would like to see happen uh, is uh, script versioning. So script versioning is something that's been introduced by SegWit that people have not talked about that much because they were focused on, you know, the capacity increase and variability fix for Lightning Network and all that. This is what everybody was talking about. But uh, what I think is one of the interesting features of SegWit is script versioning. And script versioning is essentially, you know, what the name is, right? There is a version number that is attached to uh, a SegWit script. And that allows you to add new version number that do new stuff over time. So that's a very, that's a very nice to, ex a very nice way to extend the scripting capability of Bitcoin. And this is something I would like to see up on, on, on BCH, but right now it's not the case. So speaking of uh, Sedwick, Segwit and Lightning and extensibility, um, what is like, you know, one of the big questions, I've, so, you know, we, we kind of talked uh, in the last episode about, you know, partially Bitcoin Cash was a rejection of the soft fork Segwit. Um, but, you know, why hasn't Seg, uh, Bitcoin Cash provided any alternative solution yet to transaction malleability? And there are, there were proposals. I know there was one called like flexible transactions and stuff. Um, but like, you know, is there like, I'm sure like, you know, you, you, you don't think that the, the lightning network is useful. Right. And like, so you know, Bitcoin cash, like, you know, I understand that you guys want these larger block sizes, but at some point you also want to enable things like site, uh, second layer solutions and stuff. So where is this, where is this on the roadmap of like putting the feet, putting the pieces there to enable lightning on Bitcoin cash? Yeah, so that would definitely fall into the, the extensibility, you know, bucket. Uh, I'm all for, personally, I'm all for fixing malleability and allowing people to play with second layer solution. What I'm against uh, in the case of BBC is, uh, you know, betting everything on the second layer solution and, and essentially preventing people to use the first layer. Uh, so that I'm not very fan of, but if people want to build second layer on BCH, then you know I'm I'm more than happy to have and help them if, if they need uh, if they need something. Um, so in our case specifically, we've fixed some vector of malleability, 
that are enough to do payment channel and stuff like that. So if people want to do payment channel, uh, they can do that. Actually, someone used that to implement atomic swap on BCH uh, not so long ago, Mark Lutenberg. Uh, but personally, I would like to see malleability fixed completely, but I know that a lot of people in the BCH community uh, disagree with that. So I'm not quite sure um, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen on that front. I would love to spend like a few minutes before we wrap up just on, you know, what is your high level vision for Bitcoin Cash in the long run? So we talked a little bit about, you know, mentioned Oracle and smart contracts and, and layer two. Do you think, I mean, is your vision that Bitcoin Cash kind of becomes like the blockchain where a lot of these things happen? Uh, or do you think it makes sense that there is, you know, let's say a Bitcoin cash blockchain, which is focused on electronic cash and payments. And then there's something like Ethereum, which is focused on smart contracts. And then there'll be some other blockchain focused on, I don't know, gaming. Or do, do you think uh, ideally? Yeah. Yeah. So I get yeah. it. Um, my vision personally, uh, is that during whole human history, we had to make a choice between, uh, technology for money that have good R money property, meaning like they are um, uh, very scarce and, you know, very hard to counterfeit and so on. And also technology for money that didn't add those R money property, but that were much more convenient as a medium of exchange. And so the, the way, like the thing that I see being truly revolutionary in what we are doing is that maybe for the first time in history over the past 10 years, we had technology that can do both. Very good medium of exchange and very hard monetary property. So for me, that's what is the most important. And everything else on top of that is nice to have, but it's not the groundbreaking, uh, you know, it's not the groundbreaking aspect of it. Um, and I don't quite believe in the fact that we are going to have just one blockchain to root them all. And the reason is you, in engineering, you almost always need to make trade-offs, right? So let's take, let's take BCH and Ethereum, for instance. Uh, BCH has a UTXO model similar to Bitcoin, uh, which means that you can evaluate the script for every single transaction when you spend in isolation, right? You just need the UTXO and the transaction that spend it, and you can do the computation. So the nice aspect of it is that it's uh, much more scalable than what Ethereum is doing, because in Ethereum, you can make transaction that rely on some, uh, you know, global state in the blockchain and query that state or even modify it. And that allow them to do all, all kind of very cool smart contract, but that is much more difficult to scale. And so there is clearly a, a, a trade-off here and we're making the trade-off in the direction to be uh, easier to scale. And that means that we don't have smart contract capability that are as rich as Ethereum. And Ethereum does the, the opposite, you know, they have very rich smart contract capabilities, but as a result, they are much more difficult to scale. And because those trade-offs exist, unless there is some technology at some point that you know, uh, essentially remove that trade off because we find a new trick. Um, you know, there are probably going to be a handful, a uh, handful of blockchain that make different trade off that people are interested in for different reasons. So, uh, yeah, um, I, I see a technology like BCH and a technology like Ethereum, uh, you know, both becoming big and, and both, uh, you know, having their own stuff that they do well. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think this, idea of one blockchain to root them all this is really going to materialize. Though, though right now we also have a ton of different coins. I'm not sure this is very sustainable, but um, but I, I don't think the opposite vision that one coin is going to root them all makes a lot of sense. Cool. Then, well, Amory, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for both of these episodes, I think there was a super thorough uh, exploration of Bitcoin Cash and it's really uh, very impressive like all of the different things you guys are working on and I, I think what stands out to me most of all is just 
you know, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash have really like diverged in a significant way, right? There's like very yeah. different vision, different technology, different priorities, different roadmaps. And, and these are, you know, two very independent projects at this point, you know, with each their different pros and cons. But like, it's not just a sort of, you know, simple fork running of Bitcoin. Um, so thanks so much for, for exploring that so deeply with us. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.